I am definitely ready to get back in the sanctuary. Uh, so, t- as Donna was telling us, we're going to be looking at the helmet of salvation. Um, and so, the text, uh, it, that's just a really simple statement. And put on the helmet of salvation. And so, the first thing we need to understand is what the helmet is there for. Obviously, we know uh, what a helmet is. The Roman soldiers would wear a, a, a hard helmet. It was usually made of leather and then covered with beaten uh, bronze or brass or, or metal. And that helmet is there to, to protect your grape, to protect your head. Just a few six months ago, it seems like a thousand years ago, uh, William was playing football um, against Hoax Bluff. And uh, it was the second play of the game, and Ann and I are in the stands, and <clears throat> there had been a fumble, and William had dove for the ball, and one of the Hoax Bluff players dove for the ball at the exact same time. And so the, the impact of the other player's helmet was right on his ear. And if watching the video, once his head was hit, he just went immediately limp. And I remember Ann and I standing up in the stage, and he didn't move and didn't move, and we kind of walked down uh, from the stands, and we're standing there at the fence, and he's still not moving 30 long seconds after that. And then I was, uh, I guess, a good dad and a bad husband because I jumped the fence and walked across the field. And I got there, and uh, Richard Johnson grabbed me and said, okay, he can't can't move his, his legs. And... That was a horrifying feeling there. It, but it was an impact on his head, and it, had, it, it affected his ability to move his legs. Now, thankfully, by the time we got to the ambulance, uh, he could squeeze a little bit, and then by the time we got to the hospital, he could, he could move his legs and, and push with his feet. But a helmet's purpose is to protect your head. There's no doubt about that. And so... If you think about why uh, a football player wears a helmet, why a baseball player wears a helmet, why a soldier or Marine wears a helmet, it's so that their head is protected because, you know what, you can lose an arm and you're going to have a rough day, but you can still move on. You can lose, uh, I have a friend who's a, a Marine, he lost one arm and both legs and still lives a completely successful, productive life. But if you lose your head, if your head isn't protected, you're done. And I think that what we see throughout the Bible is that that's true in our spiritual life as well. Remember, Paul is telling the, the, the in, in this book, he's telling the Ephesian believers, you need to be ready to fight. You need to, to, to have your shoes on. You need to be prepared and equipped. You need to... Make sure you've got your shield of faith. But you've got to protect what's going on in your head or everything else is lost. I remember a few years ago there was a pastor who fell in sin. And someone uh, from the media was calling the office. And I don't know who answered the phone, but the the person who uh, answered the phone told the reporter, I remember reading the article in the Wall Street Journal, he said, Every man of God is one prayerless day away from failure. And that pastor who fell into sin, he didn't wake up one day and said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go destroy my ministry today. No, months or years before that, he allowed his thoughts to go wherever they wanted to go. He didn't control what was going on in his head. And once you lose what's going on in your thoughts... The battle has already been, is well on its way to being lost. You've got to control what you're thinking, what's going on in your head. We see a biblical example of this in uh, uh, the book of 1 Kings. There's a prophet named Elijah who is, Elijah is in a situation where he feels like all of Israel has turned away from God and is following after the prophet Baal. And so he goes to Mount Carmel to have a confrontation with the prophets of Baal. 450 priests of the false god Baal come up. And there they were. And Elijah came near all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people didn't answer him a word. 
And Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left as a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. So the prophets of Baal were supposed to put a, a, a sacrifice on the altar, and then they were going to pray that Baal would cause fire to, to consume that, that, that sacrifice. And while they, they did their thing, Elijah just kind of sat around and watched them. And then he started making fun of them. This guy had enough confidence in God. Not only was he ready to, to go up against the prophets of Baal, he's mocking them. He's like, hey, maybe you need to cut yourself so you can get your God's attention. Maybe your God's going potty and he's busy right now. you got to start yelling and screaming and hooping and hollering. Get loud so your God can hear you. Because he knew good and well that Baal wasn't real. And then when it came his turn, he got them to dig a trench around the altar. The text says, at the time of the offering, Elijah came near and said, O oh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known this day that, that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant. So he had built back the altar of God. He had put 12 big stones there to represent God's people. He put the sacrifice on the altar. He dug a trench around the altar and then dumped water on it. This guy has some confidence in his God. He had no doubt who was going to win. And so he prayed said, look, I may be the only one, but God, you're still God. Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I'm your servant and I've done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that the people may know that you, O Lord, are God and you have turned their hearts back. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal and let not one of them escape. And so they grabbed all 450 of those priests. And then the text says, Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. In fact, I think the King James says he hacked them. This is a guy with some confidence in his God. He builds an altar, he pours water on it, and he says, God, do it so that all the world will know that you're God. Woof, fire comes down, burns up the offering, burns up the altar, evaporates all the water. And then this old man turns to the crowd and says, hey, let's grab those false prophets. And then he, it doesn't say that he got them to, he takes a sword and kills all 450 of them. This is a guy who's got his act together. I read that story, I'm like, yeah, that's a man. Just a few days later, in 1 Kings 19, it says, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them, those prophets that he had killed by this time tomorrow. And Elijah was afraid and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he went a day's journey further into the wilderness and sat under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, it's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And he laid down and fell asleep under a broom tree. So here, this guy who just 48 hours before was the man, he picked up a sword and went against 450 men. He is the one who stood in front of all of Israel, knowing that if he failed, they would kill him, and said, so that you know that there's a God and he reigns. Let the fire come down. And watched as God Drop the fire down. That same guy, in just two days' time, is crying under a tree and suicidal. My life is worthless. Who is this sniveling little sissy man? Where did Elijah go? Well, the Lord sent an angel. And the angel... Uh, the angel touched him and woke him up. He was taking a nap and said, hey, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, that there was a head, a little cake baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he had a cupcake. Um, and he ate and drank and lay down again. 
And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. So this tells me one thing, and you all can say on the authority of God's word, there's some times in life when what you need is a cupcake and a nap. There you go. That refreshed him. He goes off and goes down a little bit further, and he's still, though, depressed and sad. And so God took him out uh, by himself and talked to him. And he said, Elijah said to God, it's only me, I, even only I am left. And they want to seek my life and take it away. And God told him to go stand by the mount before the Lord. And the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a great fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I alone, am left. And the Lord said, Go return on the way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you will, shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. So here's the deal. What's the difference in fact, he says the same words on Mount Carmel in authority. Only I am left, and that's okay because God's big enough. His eyes are on God and his size. He says the exact same words 48 hours later. Only I'm left. And now it's the reason why he's ready to kill himself. The difference isn't in God. The difference is only in his head. Now, it's easy for me to say, all you got to do is work on your head. I remember when I uh, was in the Marine Corps and we were running a six mile run, the very first really long run. And our senior drill instructor, Staff Sergeant Adams, said to me, or said to the whole platoon, All right, so y'all can do this. I've seen you run two miles, three miles. Running is all in your head. But on about mile four, it didn't feel like it was in my head. I felt like I was going to die. I couldn't breathe. My legs hurt. My head's throbbing. It doesn't feel like it's in your head when it's there. I don't want you to hear me saying that if you are right now struggling with because of all of the junk that we're getting when you open Facebook, you watch the news, you, you read the paper, all of the death and destruction and ah, everything's terrible that's coming at you, I could sit here and say, ah, it's all in your head, just get over it, and that doesn't help a whole lot, which is why Paul doesn't say that. Emily and William and I the other day were watching a TV show that we had recorded on our, our television from four or five months ago, and it was jarring to see the difference in commercials today as to watch those commercials from six, five months ago. It was around Christmas, and all the commercials were people partying and hooping and hollering, and they were in groups of greater than ten. I'm looking at people high-fiving as they're celebrating beer or, or whatever they were commercial was for. And they're, like, Woo, they're having this party and they're eating Domino's pizza. And, and they're, they're all together and I'm sitting there going, oh, y'all are sitting too close. What's the difference? And it is all in our head. But at the same time, that's something we got to fight. And just get over it doesn't count. If you're struggling with where God is and where you are, just get over it. It doesn't do anything. And so often in the church, we just go, just let go and let God, like that's supposed to fix anything. I've told a story about how I have a friend who was a pastor. He was serving God faithfully in a little church in Coleman. And in the course of about three months, his wife left him, which meant... Uh, he lost his job because he was divorced now. She took the kids. He didn't have a job. He lost the house and the, the, the divorce settlement. He didn't have any place to live. And I, I was going to seminary in North Carolina. I called him up and I said, how you doing, brother? And he said, I just want to start this out by right now saying, if you quote Romans 8, 28 to me, I'm going to get in my car and drive North Carolina and slap you in the face. Because what he needed, not, did not want to hear is, hey, all things are going to work together, brother. Just let go and let God. 
So how do we fix our head? How do we protect what's going on in between our ears? Because if we can win the battle in our head, then we can win. Paul says, if you want to stand, you want to be the person that God's called you to be, then what you've got to do is put on the helmet of salvation. Now, what does that mean? It'd be easy for us to traipse all over the Bible and look at different ways of salvation, but in context, in the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about salvation in two very specific ways. In Ephesians chapter 2, he says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. I think the first thing we need to see about salvation, as Paul's describing it in the book of Ephesians, is that it's God doing the work. We've got to remember that no matter what's going on in this world, God is still God. We talked about that last week. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just like Elijah told the children of Israel, there is no God but Yahweh. There is no Baal. Baal is a false god, which is a Hebrew way of saying no god. He doesn't exist. And you know what? We build up gods in our culture and in our mind. I think that one of the things that the last few weeks has shown us is that we have made a god of our self-reliance. I've got control of my destiny. When all this started, remember, my my hands actually started peeling because I was washing my hands so much and hand sanitizer. I'm going to protect myself from the coronas. I've always been somebody who thought to myself, you know what? No matter what happens, I can pick myself up by my bootstraps. I've said, you know what? You could strip me naked and drop me off in a city, and in three weeks I'll I'll be a manager of a Kmart somewhere. I'm a self-reliant man. With hard work, you can get anything done. Well, you know what? There's some of you out here who lost your job no matter how hard you worked. God has exposed that we've made an idol of our self-reliance. We can't do it on our own. But you know what? He's still God. He's still God. And he still promised you that he has your life. And so the first thing we need to remember and be telling ourselves that we see in this text is but God. We need God to break into our lives. We need God to be involved. We don't need the doctors. We don't need the politicians. We don't need the governor. We we need God. The second thing we need to see is that God, it says, but God made us alive. Our dead works are gone. It says, the, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated him us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that at the coming ages he may show us the immeasurable riches of grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. Some of you, in your mind, with what you struggle with, is guilt and shame. You're not good enough. You can still hear a voice in the back of your head telling you how sorry you are, or how stupid you are, or how you're not able to do the things that God's called you to do. And what Paul is saying was, you didn't do the work to save you, that that's all God. And when you think that sort of thing, what you're actually doing is looking at God and saying, you didn't do it good enough. God's the one at work. He saved you out of that. I don't care if you were like Matthew, who was a tax collector and the lowest scum of society. I don't care if you grew up in a Christian home and went to Juana's and memorized Bible verses. I don't care which end of that spectrum you are. God's the one at work, and he does good stuff. All of the shame and punishment that we deserve, God took. When Jesus declared on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. It's finished. Believe that. Love won. 
So in your head, in your mental conversation, when you hear something coming up that says, hey, you're not good enough to help Don out in Kid City. You're not, you're not smart enough to go do that. You can't go do that. When the enemy's in your head whispering, remember that God saved you. He didn't save the world. He saved you. I'm not saying he didn't die to save the world. Hold it. I, I don't want to have any bad theology here but i want you to think about the fact yes god does so love the world but god saved you from your trespasses and sins not from my trespasses and sins but from yours and if you can keep that in your head that will protect you from a lot of the enemy's assaults and then finally we see our it's not finally so i guess that's preacher finally um We're saved for future glory. I just read that. In the coming ages, he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We're seated in the heavenly places. When I preached through this text, we talked about it. Yes, it's something that's going to happen in the future. But Paul uses the past tense. He seated us. And the reason he does that is it happened. He's so sure of it, it's like it's already occurred. And so if that's the case, then this world to us is not our home. If your retirement stopped tomorrow and you lost your house, this ain't your home. If you lose your job, this ain't your home. If you get the COVID and end up in the hospital getting intubated, this world is not your home. One of the ways we can protect our mind from going to places it doesn't need to go is to remember that God has created us or has saved us and is moving us toward future grace, toward future glory. Every funeral I've ever preached, I quote from 1 Thessalonians, Beloved, I would not have you ignorant about those who have gone before. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of an archangel. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And those of us who are alive and remain will join them in the air. And together we will be with them forever. This is not our end of our story. This life is not all we got. So if you can keep that in your head, then when bad things come against you, this ain't my home. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That will protect you from so much. And then finally, and this is the real finally. In Ephesians 2.10 it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. You were saved for a reason. Nobody got saved, or did God save you just so you can sit around and be the calcified, glorified saint. God did not save you to sit on a pew. No matter what's going on in your life, I don't care what it is, no matter what's going on in your life, God has put you there for a reason. And you're to go to work for him. Saints don't retire. So if you're in a hospital getting chemotherapy, pray with the person sitting beside you. If you're in the unemployment office, love on the people around you. If you are sick, pray for those nurses. No matter what's going on in your life, God's got you there for a reason. He is in control. Romans 8.28 is still in the Bible that all things work together for the good to them who love him. We've just got to realize that God has you on mission. And if you've got that in your head, if you realize that no matter what happens, that God's got you doing that for a reason, then that changes everything. God knows what he's doing. We have to trust him. We have to look for opportunities to serve him. And we have to remember This world is not our home. Father God, I pray that you would help us to put on the helmet of salvation every day. That every day we would get up 
and we would realize that the enemy is in our ear whispering lies. And Lord, we would fight those lies that we would re- re- remember that he called us before the foundations of the world and after this world is burnt up, we'll be singing his praises. That this story is about him and that we get to serve him. Oh God, I pray that that would have an impact in the way that we live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.